Greetings, adventurers, and welcome to the Mike Flares podcast, coming to you today from an ancient castle overlooking a mistbound woods. Um, I am your host, Martin O'Dwyer, and with me today, as always, is your other host, Connor O'Brien. How are we doing today, Connor? Spooky intro, Martin. Indeed. <laughs> I don't I did know if we should be in this castle. Zoink, Scoob! No, I can't do it, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I used to be able to do it when I was a kid, and then my voice broke. Zoinks! <laughs> Um, <laughs> God, can we please run a, a mystery oh, ink one shot? Please, one of my favorite things in fiction was when they did the supernatural Scooby Doo crossover. It was perfect. Oh, oh. did I accidentally just ruin, uh, ruin, ruin it there by swearing too early? Nope, we're good. Are we good? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> it was ah, sure look. It was a close thing. It's grand. Um, but yeah, we're talking about oh, just the spookiest book ever. Um, and it's really, I'm super super happy with it. Uh, Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft came out this week. Yeah. Um, I I we're, I'm gonna say this up front. Um, this book is so chunky. I've not even gotten through half of <laughs> it. Um, it is. It's like two hundred and something pages thick. It's it's as thick as like. What what are the thick books? Um, Icewind Dale's pretty thick. Everon is pretty thick. The Dungeon Master, Dungeon Master's Guide is pretty thick. Well, Dungeon Master's Guide, Baldur's Gate, like it's as it's as big as any of those. There is so much information in this book. Um, like if I just if I just look at the uh, at the what's the word contents. where it tells you all the contents contents. <laughs> where it tells I li- you. <laughs> I, I I literally said the word. I literally said you know the thing the thing where it tells you all the contents. You mean the contents? That's the one. Mars, um, what's that thing you used to? Dig food. Dig food. You mean a spoon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but like, okay. So we have like character creation options, which include like gothic lineages, mm-hmm. dark gifts, subclasses, backgrounds. Then we move on to ex- explanations about domains of dread and like what kind of different types of horror, like body horror, cosmic horror, folk horror, ghost stories. Um, then it goes on to the individual domains of dread, each of which I, I have yet to see one I do not like. Yeah. And I haven't gotten through them all. I've yet to see one I do not like. Literally every single thing has such a unique spin or or interesting point. There's like 30-something of those. And they have um, a bunch of different themes and settings as well. It's really cool. Mm. There's there's a very um like Dark Souls style, dark fantasy, like the gr- you're in the like the last days of a grand empire and everything is crumbling like the dust around you kind of uh, domain. That, oh god man when i ran that dark souls one shot for you i wish i had that place it sounds was really this, cool was this dark on uh no it's it's a different no. one it's in the other domains list i don't think you've gotten oh, okay okay <laughs> i haven't gotten to that's the thing i was going through the main ones and there's some main ones where they give a lot of information for each one uh there's i don't know uh, judging by eye maybe 15 out of those and then there's a list about 15 or 20 along of other domains and each one of those um you pointed out to me that one of them is a literal ghost train oh, and i have god, no I idea i'm like that is i don't know that's just too cool it's oh god have you ever played final fantasy 6 uh no <laughs> there's a bit in final fantasy 6 where you fight a boss who's a ghost train and you can one of the characters has, is like a ninja and you can suplex the ghost train and oh my god, I want to play that domain with like a, a fighter grappler and suplex the ghost train because <laughs> the ghost train is the Dark Lord. Uh, then we have some or oh, some people like some some well known characters and stuff like that, uh, yep. like Rudolph von Richten. Uh, Erasmus von Richten is in it as well. His his ghost his ghost boyo. Oh yeah. Uh, there's some groups of the Vestani and the Keepers of the Feather and stuff They're like that. They're very cool. They're very very There's cool. Additional things like uh, horror adventures, you have like tarot deck stuff, curses, fears and stress, haunted traps, survivors. Then there's a whole adventure uh, called the House of Lament. Um, and then, and then after all of that, we have what I consider to be one of the best bestiaries we've gotten in a very long time. Oh, um, dude, there are so many nasty creatures in that bestiary. And... I, I, I was shaping up. I had a very clear idea of my next D and D campaign. <laughs> And like what it was going to center around and now i'm considering just bumping that out a couple of years and just playing my next one like maybe a one to ten campaign in i i i, I redid my map because <laughs> of this book i i had a section of of wilderness and stuff like that up in the north and at first it was just going to be like wildlands with a few tribes and stuff like that i'm like Do you know what 
now it's like an Eastern European Slavic haunted land with vampires and werewolves and and headless horsemen and all this other stuff. Uh, and I'm just that that's a place now. That's a new thing. Wasn't there before, entirely because of this book. Uh, because I want yeah. to populate it with all the all the beasties that are in that bestiary. It's so so good. Oof. Oh my god. Oh man, yeah, it's. We were saying this before we started recording, but it's it's been a while since a book came out that's had just this much good info in it. Uh, like more, we both, we both at the same time because we're finishing each other's sandwiches. Um, uh, just immediately called out that's like probably not since Morden Kynans has a book come out that's had like yeah. his uh, Morden Kynans was the one with all the info about like the, the blood war between like the demons and the devils and all that wasn't it and the war between and, like, yes the and it had and the face stuff as well it had in it as well I believe yeah the creation of the elves and the drow and their betrayal and all that kind of stuff yeah, yeah. which I mean like ugh, world building wise was just astound I think oh, yeah world building wise was so so good like um like just just as a testament to how okay so typically D books are made up of like crunch which is the, or is it called crunch that's called it? yeah it's a crunch right it's like when it has like solid mechanics and new magic items new monsters classes they call that crunch right you're uh you're a little bit too elite for me there my friend i'm afraid i've never heard that before <laughs> <laughs> okay okay uh sorry my eliteness is uh is overbearing um yeah, there. So I uh, typically people refer to that. I think in the D and D community as crunch when you get hard mechanical stuff. So a new sense. monster stat block, magic items, uh, subclasses, uh, races, all that kind of stuff. And um, there's a lot of that in this book. There is literally uh, subclasses, races, backgrounds, monsters, loads of stuff like that. And I'm like, and typically I think people tend to be more interested in that than some of the flavor fluff and stuff like that. Yeah. That tip that can you know help populate a book. Um, I'm so drawn in by all of the domains and I've been reading them I I didn't even realize or I, I didn't even bother looking <laughs> over the subclasses that are in this that's how good the domains are as someone who yeah. typically goes straight for the crunch I go for the monsters I go for the magic items immediately before reading anything else um, I didn't even look at the subclasses because I was so drawn in with how good these uh, these domains are and how many ideas they just spawned in my, in my head it was ugh. yeah um, dare I say, Martin? I can't even. <laughs> oh God, kind of really. <laughs> so you can add though. <laughs> another, another sip of my coffee. Sorry. Yeah. Um. So because I knew I would be hosting the episode this week, um, and that we would probably cover Van Richten's because it just came out. Um. I tried to get kind of a, a just a quick overview of everything. Um. So with the there's two subclasses. Um. One bard subclass and one warlock subclass. For the bard, it's called the College of Spirits, and it mm. basically centers around your bard as a psychic medium that acts through either like a Ouija board. I know it's it's specifically. Um, like it, it's it's a tarot deck, but I believe it's called the Taraka deck. Um, yeah, they had their own in canon yeah. version, which I think I think it actually showed up in Curse of Strahd as well. If you go to the back of the book, there's pages that are just showing the designs of each of the Taraka cards. Ooh, I love them; they're all the art for those is always so good. Um, same, I love tarot style card design. Oh, same they're with so the uh, with the deck of many things. Ooh, so good. Yeah, so good. Or if you play Dragon Age Inquisition, when you're picking your class, each of the races and each of the classes has their own tarot style card Ooh, as well. It's yeah. really really cool. Actually, speaking about it, the art in this is top class as well. There's some oh, wow. there's a there's some art of two of a like a dampier fighting a vampire. Who like, yes. Oh man, <laughs> it's so good. It's so so good. Um, Jeff, yeah, sorry, we'll get back on point with it. So, with the bard, yeah, you're basically like a, a psychic medium. You can hold seances using your cards, um, and by channeling spirits through the cards, you can do certain things. Um, so, uh, I, ha I have it open here just so I can actually give the correct names for it. Um, you get the guidance cantrip as well when you take this at, at um, third level, which is class because it's the, the, the narrative is it's the spirits of the dead guiding you. Which yeah, is yeah. Really so cool. a bit of foresight would kind of make sense in that case. Yeah. Yeah. Um. You get a you get a spiritual focus as well. Um. And that can be what's well, really cool. Is it can be a candle, crystal ball, skull, spirit board, or a taraka deck. How cool That's is really that? Cool. I yeah. I just I just love the idea of a bard that like pulls a skull out and is like, alas, poor Yorick, I knew him well, and then like Yorick <laughs> shows up, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Um, but the the core mechanic of this class, I I, I would call is a subclass rather is called uh, Tales from Beyond, where um you use your medium to reach out to reach out to spirits of the dead and they tell their tales through and the tales basically 
you ro you um, roll your bardic inspiration die and there's a table you roll on with 12 options and depending on what you roll on that table you use your bardic inspiration die to get additional effects um, and there they be positive and negative and you can like there's there's ones that will deal damage um, and there's other ones that will like uh, boot buff people heal them give them fun abilities or like you could use it on yourself or other creatures as well um i was talking telling connor about one that's a uh, one of my particular favorites is a uh, tale of the dragon uh, the target spews fire from from the mouth in a 30 foot cone each creature in that area must make a deck save taking fire damage equal to four rolls of bardic inspiration die in a fail save at higher levels dear god because don't bardic inspiration die scale up to d12 they up to d12 yeah they cap out that's, d12 that's 4 d12 <laughs> and, a, and a 30 foot cone is no yeah. joke as well like. yeah it's it's class um there's other really cool ones as well like a uh, tale of the angel target regains hit points equal to two rolls your bardic inspiration die plus your charisma modifier and you can end one condition for following this blind deafened paralyzed petrified or poisoned um there's really cool there's other ones where like um if uh yeah, you make you make a a, a target. So you, it's called a tail of the Avenger. You target a creature you can see within thirty feet, and if anything hits that creature, you can use your reaction to make it take um, force damage equal to a couple of rolls of your bardic inspiration die as well. Um, there's a there's there's like there's twelve of them, and I don't want to kind of go into each and every one, but they're they all are very very useful. Um, a lot of them have stuff with mobility. There's one that lets you teleport. There's another one that heals and gives you and gives you um extra movement speed and AC. Um, there's just lots of really cool stuff in there. Um. Oh, and I really. Re what? Sorry, maybe you said it already. What's fueling? Um, what's fueling these? Oh, uh, uh, bardic inspiration die. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I figured as much. I just wanted to make sure. So yeah, I mean, like that. I, I, I like when things give you more uses for your bar your bardic inspiration die. Yeah. Um, because like, don't get me wrong. I mean, giving yep. someone a bardic inspiration die for a potential roll or save or something like that is really, really helpful. But um, I like. I, I think I think too many, too many bards are your silly um musician comedian yeah. um try to sleep with everything uh kind of <laughs> characters um and i feel like this is a real a real departure from that yeah. but in a really good way it's a very unique take on um on bards which yeah. i, I I'm, really, I'm, really enjoy. I'm actually kind of surprised it's a bard but i absolutely love it um there's a it's other really big ability then would be at six level feature called spirit session where you basically you conduct a seance with um up to your proficiency modifier number of creatures including you um and basically you learn a spell from any ch of your choice from any class uh at the end of the ritual the only thing the only uh catches to it is that you have to ch the spell you choose has to be of a level equal to the number of creatures that conduct the ritual or less it has to be of a level you can cast and it has to be either divination or necromancy and then it casts as a bard spell it counts as a bard spell for you um and uh, you, you and, uh, that was not my understanding of the term spirit session <laughs> yeah no vodka involved uh, here uh yeah yeah but like uh I, it, so good, we, I was we were saying before the uh before the podcast uh i like that this is tied to how many people are involved with it because i think <laughs> a, a, a hilarious encounter that could ensue is if your party is limited to three or four people but you desperately need to learn a fifth level spell using this ability it would be really, really funny to go into a bar and try to find someone who's drunk and be like, hey, do you want to like come and hang out with us? Maybe in a round circular table, joining hands and chanting. And then just like trying to convince some drunker to be like, yeah, sure. Is there, is there a drink? And like, we can bring you some drink if you if that will let you, if you'll just sit with us for an hour. Because um, I, I just uh. think that's really, really funny. Um that you may you may end up need to do it you may end up needing to do that in later levels particularly yeah. you know which is just really funny to me. I love uh, the one I love I, something that popped into my head there when you were saying that I thought it'd be a hilarious version of that would be like if you're trying to like sneak into a base and you like uh, you need like a fifth level spell but there's only four e <laughs> so you just like capture a goblin or like fucking hold my hand fucking hold my hand yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you live as long as this ritual lasts so be grateful oh wait I I know I need to check something here. Um, you know, oh, which, which we don't join this Oh, it's a willing. Creature. Sorry, it's willing. Willing creature. Damn it! Damn it! I was gonna say, like, you could just, you could just like tie someone up and sit in the just sit in the chair and be quiet. <laughs> and then you, you just start doing the chanting and the ritual, and then you just let them go afterwards. Like, we only need you for the hour. Get lost. Yeah. Um, tell, tell no one about what you saw. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <coughs> sorry. Moving on to um the other one that we have then is uh the undead warlock, where um your patron is a deathless being, so like uh, a lich. Uh, would be a would be a good patron for these um and you're kind of themed a lot along that way the spells you get are actually pretty cool you get uh 
Bane, False Life, Blindness, Deafness, Phantasmal Force, Phantom Steed, Speak With Dead, Death Ward, Greater Invisibility, Anti-Life Shell, and Cloud Kill, which are all really good, really useful spells. I'm a particular sucker for Phantom Steed because I just think that's cool. I love just to have the ability to summon like a Ghost Rider horse. Like, oh, yeah. dude, so cool. So cool. But for this, it'd probably be more like the horse dead, like the horse Death rides on. Like just this like emaciated skeletal kind of like yeah, mu- exposed yeah. muscle kind of horse. Um, but the the kind of main gimmick of this class is you get a you get a transformation aspect um, at first level called form of dread. Uh, you activate it and you transform for a minute as an action. Uh, you gain it. You get a d10 plus your warlock level temporary hit points. Uh, once during each of your turns, when you hit a creature with an attack roll, um, you can force it to make a wisdom save. Um, and if they fail, they're frightened of you until the end of your next turn. Um, and then you yourself are immune to being frightened. So you're you're uh, really good for, particularly for a warlock, like upfront kind of mucking in with the with the fighter and the barbarian, almost like a an almost like a an arcane paladin style um, warlock. I'm picturing um, I'm picturing kind of almost like when Gladriel is tempted by the ring Ooh. and she turns into that dark aspect of herself. Uh, and I, I'm just like even if you weren't uh, done wrong, I think with the temporary HP in particular, um. And, and rushing in to smack somebody and then make them fearful of you and have them run away. Um, that could be a really, really good way to do it, but you can also do it with, like, uh, like attack... Like, for example, it is with an attack roll. That could be spells as well. Oh, yeah, so blast. you could, like, cast fly on yourself or something like that, hover above, you know, uh, a street where some people are charging you, and then just that lace and spells left, right, and center. And actually, you've got to think about it. When you hit a creature with an attack roll, let's see... You, there's no limit on that so technically couldn't you use that with your no, sorry, once in each of your turns never mind I take that back it's yeah. once in each of your turns but, uh, but I mean you, you could be lacing Eldritch Blast to people and having people fleeing from this dark aspect Galadriel style thing floating in the middle of the street as well you hell, know? hell yeah uh, the next big thing you get then is 6 level Grave Touched uh, you get some nice ribbon abilities like you don't need to eat drink or breathe um, which is useful. In I always, I always love when something lets you not breathe. <laughs> and whenever, I, whenever I've played an air ganassi, and it's been a couple times, I start out the session by turning to the DM and saying, "I stop breathing." <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll let you know when I start again because they don't have to breathe as well. <laughs> That's guess. Um, th- those are kind of the nice little like uh, ribbon abilities you have. But what's really what's kind of the more mechanically beneficial thing about it is, um, in addition, once during each of your turns, when you hit a creature with an attack roll and damage, uh. At an attack roll and roll damage against the creature you can replace the damage type with necrotic damage and while using your form of dread you can roll one additional damage die when determining the necrotic damage that target takes so if you're in your form of dread and you start like you're saying lacing eldritch blasts into people if you if somehow they're one of the rare creatures with uh, resistance to force damage um yeah. you could switch that up to necrotic if you wanted to um you could do that with like if you were attacking someone or like a sword um because you know this would be like you could just be a good melee one you could swap out the sword slashing damage for necrotic damage yeah which would be which really again cool. w- w- would uh would help you overcome uh resistances to uh non-magical weapons or or maybe if if they require like so it maybe like so there are there's few enough of them but some creatures are just straight up resistant to bludgeoning piercing slashing non-magic and non-magical included so like this would help you circumvent that as well because you could get around yeah. the yeah with the with necrotic damage i like anything like that that allows you to kind of like meddle with your damage types to uh, like a, as a not necessarily as a reaction but just to give you the option um there's a new um a new sorcerer thing in Tasha's yes, wasn't that uh, the meta magic that, that you change, change damage types yeah. Yeah. yeah oh my god acid fireball like <laughs> Del- acid change a uh, delayed blast fireball to acid i like how whenever we talk about damage types it's acid, acid is one we, we always go to that's what, like <laughs> it's because i think we both agreed acid is one of the most fucked up damage types in the oh, game oh hell yeah uh, and also my sorcerer has vitriolic sphere on her spell list and she yeah that works real well <laughs> yep oh god uh, i was only i was watching some castlevania some new castlevania a while ago and there were some creatures spitting globules of acid and burning th- trees and burning people and i was like that, that's not that shit's not uh that's no joke you know no that's so awful <laughs> um anyway back to the warlock the, the next big thing you get is your necro- is uh, called necrotic husk uh, at 10th level you basically be uh, your connection to dead necrotic energy uh, grow, uh grows and necrotic energy now saturates your body you uh, get you gain resistance to necrotic damage and when you're transformed into your form of dread you are now immune to necrotic damage instead which is really really good which actually makes you like uh, a, an undead warlock that's really good against undead yeah absolutely yeah um 
Uh, immunity to anything is great, but I mean, like, I can think of some high-level undead that do a lot of necrotic mm -hmm. damage. I think that Atropol one yes. that uh, that I put you up against one time, I think that does it does something necrotic-based pretty heavily. If I'm, I could be misremembering that, but either way, um, like, there's some high-level undead that you would you would be very happy to have immunity to to necrotic damage when going against. Yeah, the the next part of it to get, which is oh, this is so cool. I love this. This is so so cool. In addition, when you would be reduced to zero hit points, you can use a reaction to drop to one hit point instead and cause your body to erupt with deathly energy. Each creature of your choice that is within 30 feet of you takes necrotic damage equal to 2d10 plus your warlock level. You then gain one level of exhaustion. Once you use this reaction, you can't do so again until you finish 1d4 long rests. Dude, that's so cool. That's that's a relentless endurance plus a, a, an area of effect, a big area of effect, um... Uh, hellish rebuke that's necrotic damage instead of yeah. fire and that's just um, flat plus your warlock level that's flat plus your warlock level as well oh, man, anything after level 5 yeah. that's a lot of damage to just stack on yeah it, it has a high cost oh, with, yeah. the, with the level of exhaustion and then of course um, you can't do it again until you finish 1d4 long rest I don't think I can't off the top of my head think of anything else in any other subclass that tells you you have to wait multiple long rests to recover uh Magic items have it quite a lot. Very spells few have it. subclasses. Yeah. Which have it? Spells have it. Uh, like stuff like uh, divine intervention. You can't use. You can't use that. Um, divine intervention. Seven days. Divine inter but that, that that's like set. Yeah, it's like seven full days. Uh, that's only after it's been su successfully used as well. Though. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, and then at fourteenth level for the warlock, you get basically you get uh, a thing called spirit projection where um, you can astral project essentially as an action you project your spirit from your body your body you leave behind is unconscious and in a state of suspended animation uh, you look like yourself um, but you don't have your possessions and any damage or other effects that apply to your spiritual or physical body affects the other so there's there's no shenanigans where your spirit is like invulnerable or anything um, you can remain outside your body for up to one hour until, or until your connection is broken as if concentrating on a spell uh, when the projection ends your spirit returns to your body or your body magically teleports to your spirit space to your choice which is really cool because if someone start like rocks up on you when you're unconscious and starts shanking you when you're unconscious you could teleport your body to your spirit and out of danger yeah true yeah i like that that's all that's all you like what's our yeah there's there's some other spell or some class ability that does that where you can send in like echo knight a might be echo knight i think it's echo knight uh, yeah, yeah. I, I they can it send is. in one of their they, it is they can send in one of their echoes to kind of scout ahead and then they can either choose to cancel it and they're just back in their body or they can choose to then trade the yeah, places of their places. physical form with their echo like yeah echo knight is very cool i like echo knight a lot hmm. um so yeah uh, while projecting your spirit you gain the following benefits your spirit and body regain resistance to bludgeoning piercing and slashing uh you when you cast a spell of the conjuration or necromancy school the spell doesn't require verbal or somatic components or material components that lack a gold cost which is super cool uh you get a flying speed equal to your walking speed and can hover and you can move through uh, uh, creatures and objects as if they were difficult terrain but you take a d10 force damage if you end your turn inside a creature and object and while you're using form of dread uh once during each of your turns when you deal necrotic damage to a creature you regain hit points equal to half the amount of necrotic damage dealt so yeah uh, anyway and you can't use it again until you finish a long rest tanky warlock <laughs> yeah like, like you said it would actually do uh, a fantastic just take uh, um, take eldritch smite as one of your invocations as well yeah um i really like uh i i like that it has a fly speed mm. uh so you, you and and the fact you can kind of teleport to your body that'd be really really good or teleport your body to you i should say i feel like you could technically use that to infiltrate a lot of castles, keeps, prisons, and such. Um, fly your ghost up through the wall, inside, find where you need to be, and then you know deactivate it and bring your body to you. And then oh, yeah. it's just like, wow, now here my physical form. Yeah. Oh, man. really, really cool. Multi-class that with like rogue and good luck keeping me out of anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> that would actually be really good. Yeah. Man, war warlock and rogue. Uh, rogue is the kind of class that like multi-classes with anyone really, really well. Um, warlocks are uh, are not uh, uh, are as well, including warlocks. Um, that would be a fantastic one to like be able to ghostly teleport inside a building and then assassinate someone and then ghostly teleport out. Yeah, I don't. Think... Although you can't, you can't use more than once. It's, like, it's a long, it's a long rest thing, so it'd be like sneak in, assassinate someone, drop dead on the floor. <laughs> yeah, true. Actually, yeah, just your body. You stab them, and as soon as you do, someone's like, he just stabbed that person, and then you just go to. 
<laughs> and you're like out on the ground. <laughs> oh no, I have fallen ill, and you like fall on the ground with resistance and bludgeoning, piercing, and, sla- and slash. Yeah. They're trying to stab you, and then you just disappear. You you could you could just be like because your body's in a state of suspended animation. I would argue that that does not look like sleep. It just looks like you're maybe dead or like you know in stasis, so you're not really breathing. I would argue that you could just be like you don't need stab to this person, and then just drink a little vial of water and be like, I drank the same poison, and then you fall <laughs> over. <laughs> <laughs> and the guards are like, he he stabbed the he stabbed the king, and then he killed himself, and then your body just vanishes in ten minutes time. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, just hope um, hope you get to that before they start mounting your head on a pike outside the front gate. Yeah, I I would I would hope that if you're, uh, if you drank if you drank the poison and killed yourself after the assassination, you'd be let off the hook. Nah, uh, no, nah, that's not how it works. <laughs> if history says anything, that's not how that works. <laughs> Uh, well, it certainly wouldn't work inside any of the uh, many domains of dread that this book uh, this book goes into detail on. Ooh, that was. Uh, they're all pretty rel- relentless and pretty uh, pretty grim places to exist in. They're they're all pretty fucking hardcore, all right? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Uh... Uh, are there any that kind of stood out to? Well, which one? Which ones were you kind of uh, really engrossed by, or what ones kind of grabbed you? Okay, so there's, in terms of like the more like traditional domains, um, I really really liked uh, Icath and Falkovnia. Um, me and you were talking about how much both of us actually really liked Falkovnia and just the concept behind it. Yeah, so Valko- Falkovnia, uh, Falko- Falkovnia is a uh, pronunciation. Um, <laughs> is uh is basically like a country that is under siege from a zombie apocalypse, essentially. Uh, and as a result, now the military, the martial law has been declared. Uh, no one is free anymore. The military is basically enslaving people to build barricades, work fields, and everything else, all in an attempt to keep the population alive. No one has any freedom or anything like that. Uh, they're just they're just concerned about surviving the undead hordes, um, and which I think is just a fantastic, fantastic setting. Oh, it's so good. Um, and don't the doesn't the horde like appear randomly in one in a, in a location within the domain that has the most people? And uh, right at the moment now, it's uh, it's like Falkovnia's uh, capital city. Like, uh, just, yes, I believe so. Yeah, I like, think I think they they emerge from the mist. Yeah, they just they? appear out yeah. of the mist like just a horde of undead. Oh, I love uh, it. It, it, that there's also. Uh, the first, actually, I will want to say just in general for all these domains, there are some beautiful maps oh of each God, of the domains. Yes. I think are absolutely stunning. Um, but there's there's also obviously each domain has its own dark lord, and and Vladeska Drakov is a uh, even though she's a tyrannical military dictator, uh, kind of a badass as well. There's some <laughs> artwork of here and everything of her here. Um, with multiple zombies climbing a wall and she's just battering them off like it's really really cool <laughs> yeah some of, there's some oh man just the art um, for some of the some of the domains and stuff is really really cool um, and particularly for some of the NPCs that you'll meet it's very very like it's, it's always like the, D, like the art in the D&D books is always top tier but just it feels like they've pushed but like it feels like like they were like okay do you know though you've been letting you draw like fantasy stuff for years right do horror and just go nuts and like everyone, and I, I mean, just they have like went for it. Like I absolutely mm-hmm. adore it. Um, I so... think uh, I think Falkovnia would make for uh, an incredible. Uh, I mean, like the the great thing about so many of these domains is they would fit in with other with other worlds. You know, like I could see this being a thing where like it doesn't have to be a a, a domain of dread that you you travel through the mists and you end up in this kind of demi plane kind of thing. You could honestly just drop the map of this onto an island, say that it's off the coast of the main continent, and the whole island is now overrun with uh, with with zombies, uh, and you're now dealing with this supernatural zombie threat uh, because you've arrived here, or maybe maybe you got shipwrecked on it, and now you have to make your way to the city, and the guards there are like, "Oh, you've got to work now in order to be able to live here," uh, and maybe that's the whole the whole plot there or something like that. I think that could be super super cool. Ooh, that, yeah that would be cool um there is oh, i can't remember the name but there's there's one of in the one of the other domains where it's basically a domain that's uh do you ever do you know that movie the deadliest game i do not it's uh basically it's like rich uh this rich lunatic gets a bunch of normal people on on, an, on his like tropical island and a bunch of rich people hunt the regular people for sport oh this is the one with the 
with the battle royale is is it uh Valachan? Um where they it's like a jungle. Um No, this is like this is like a this is from like the seventies. No, sorry, I'm think I'm talking about the domain. Oh Valachan, yeah, yeah, Valachan, I think it is actually Valachan, yeah. Yeah, it's a it's like a tropical jungle island. Um and it's run by one second now, I'm gonna get your man's name up. Um his it's... name is uh Chakuna. And he he hunts people with packs of displacer piece. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one that one is no sorry that's a different one I think is it? It's because oh, the it? one I was thinking of there. So there was a dark lord who ran that competition. Then, uh, it, but he ran it specifically to hunt this one tribe. Then uh, a woman from that tribe willingly entered the competition so that she could hunt him down, and she did, and she killed him, and she has now become the new dark lord of the area and runs the hunt. Okay, different one. So in this case, this one is like uh, is uh, it's it's a tropical jungle. Uh, Valakan hosts the trial of the hearts, uh, a battle royale conducted during the certain full Ooh. moons uh, by the land's greatest hunter, uh, Chakuna. Um, pa- packs of displacer beasts roam the jungle, led by Yana, a perpetually cunning, or pre- sorry, preternaturally cunning displacer beast that serves uh, Chakuna. Packs of displacer beasts is just nasty. <laughs> I know, right? Could you imagine just like like Roman, like uh, I like when you look at something like uh, Barovia, and they're like packs of wolves are in the woods, and you're like, yeah, but look at this place. This, this place would be central. <laughs> yeah. Um. Oh god. I okay. I just gotta talk about it because it is probably my favorite one. It's um, Sawyer thirteen thirteen, the morning rail. Yeah. So we mentioned this a while ago. This yeah. is the ghost train. It's, yeah. Okay. Oh god, I love it so much. I just love it so much. Um, the whole the lore behind it is that um, there was a terrible calamity about to happen in this one city, and they had these lightning rail trains that um that were connected that they could use that, that people were using to evacuate. Um, the last train leaving gets delayed like ten or fifteen minutes because there's an important VIP that's being escorted by the city guard onto like the front train, and it's all being kept very hush hush. But the delay that that causes ends up with the train getting caught in the calamity and like everyone on board dies and the train is destroyed but the train ends up still hurtling on along the old lightning rail line um and the whole thing is a dark domain everyone in it um doesn't know they're dead and they're all trying to like figure out who this passenger in the front in the front is and like what's going on and they're like eternally trapped in that train just going round and round and round and if you're a demon slayer fan that most will sound really familiar to the demon slayer movie which uh, was immediately what I thought of when I heard of this, which is fuck. Oh, so it, dude, just one of my absolute favorite things. <laughs> it uh, it that, that that's one that would actually fit perfectly into um Eberron because they have lightning Ooh, rails in, yes. in Eberron. And this is one so of if you are already running an Eberron campaign and want to inject a little bit of horror, that's the perfect one for yeah, you there. Running an Eberron campaign in October, you could totally just sneak in a ghost train without people even know. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and what's uh, I, cool I, I, about I, that one is that one can show up in other domains as well. I was just gonna say it as well. The fact that it's a it's a train, it kind of it could move across dimension. So like in theory, you could you could do it as a standalone, but but you could it very easily fits into your homebrew or into whether you're running Dragonlance, uh, whether you're running uh, Eberron, whatever world you're running, even if it's your own home, even if it's your own homebrew, I can't speak. <laughs> um, it's all good. Even if it's your own homebrew world that would fit in beautifully to it because it's by by its nature that domain yeah is mobile is it, it moves from place to place yeah um and it's oh, oh god i can see the horror movie in my head now like you you run them through curse of strad i uh, run them through barovia they get out of barovia they go through the mists and find the train station in the mist they wait there mm. and the and uh, sire 1313 pulls up and then you go and that's what we pick up next week on the ghost train yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh i think that that actually that could be the ghost train could be a really cool medium for like oh a, moving the players between the domains oh, exactly if you want to do it, a, so a, cool. a domain the domains of dread hopping campaign uh, and the Don't desire 1313 13 is like maybe that's the way you start off on the train and you can wake up there and you're not sure where you are or why you're there and then it drops you off at a domain and then you need to solve whatever problem is there and then get back on the train and go to the next domain. That would be to, that a is... really cool, like, supernatural or, like, Van Helsing-style Monster Hunter campaign where, like, you mm-hmm. know that there's this ghost train and if you go on this ghost train, it will bring you to all these places where these monsters exist lurking in the dark waiting to get you. And it's your job to get on that train knowing full well what, what could happen and make your way between all of these horrific places trying to, like, eliminate the monsters so that your home is safe. Uh similar to that one where it's it's mobile and stuff like that is uh is the carnival domain 
which uh, I think it has there's something about um about the carnival being I think it's maybe the same reason that like clowns are scary to yeah. some people because they're smiling and they're colorful and they should be happy and silly but there's something kind of creepy about them and I think that's why the carnival works so well because it's it's colorful lights and it's food and everyone's laughing and having fun but there's something just a little bit off about it all yeah the, the, um, the sinister carnival is like such a good trope and i think what could be really cool with this is if you mixed in a bit of the cult of Rakdos as well you could do something really messed up oh that that's the blood cult from uh isn't yeah. it from but they have together like, uh yeah but they're in ravnica yeah but isn't ravnica magic together they are yeah but like that's what i mean like you could mix a little yeah. bit of that cult in here um because they have like mm. blood circuses yeah i know they, that showed up in one of the actually i think it showed up in a couple of the uh, uh of yeah. the uh, acquisitions incorporated uh games which is really, really funny <laughs> yeah two or three of them um, yeah but like that's I, I, what i really loved about this one is the kind of setting i think that that uh carnival that creepy carnival thing is really really great you could have a lot of really wacky interesting characters there and uh, what i love is there's the the dark lord of this particular domain so the the carnival is led by a, an eladrin woman named isolde or is old uh, is old like yeah uh uh, so she is an Aladrin. Uh, her art looks really cool. Uh, she's got like like really cool hair and really long pointed ears and everything. Um, she runs the carnival. She is not the Dark Lord. The Dark Lord is the Holy Avenger longsword that she wields <laughs> named Nepenthe. Nepenthe, her sword, is the Dark Lord of this domain and she just she is essentially just bit carrying the sword around <laughs> but uh, and enacting what the sword commands her to do. I think Ooh. that I read that and I stopped everything I was doing and I I, show, I, I put my iPad to Tara and I said, read that. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, that is so cool. The sword is the, is the actual big bad in, 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 this, uh, in this domain, which is really, really cool. Yeah. Uh, there's a there's one that I just love. There's one that I just absolutely love because it pulls straight from Celtic, Celtic mythology, which is always a, a big plus in my books, um, which is the Rider's Bridge and uh that is basically your sleepy hollow headless horseman style uh dark domain and the domain is the rider as well as the dark lord how does that work the domain is the rider and the dark lord it's the same same way it works as the train but i mean like okay oh as in like does he like he just he can just appear in an area and that area becomes the domain um, so like okay, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. I, yeah, I, yeah. I have I have it here anyway. So uh, what's really cool actually is when with all the with the other domains you start looking into them, they give you Dark Lord hallmarks and then a, a, a like a short paragraph. So uh, the, the Dark Lord here is the Rider. So the Rider's Bridge would be the domain. Um, hallmarks Haunted Bridge Murderous Legend. Nearly every domain knows some version of the apparition called the Headless Rider. It appears as a mercenary in dark armor in Mordant, a ghostly cataphract. Yeah, cataphract in Harakir. And a mutated centaur in Lemuria, but in each incarnation, certain details remain true. The rider is missing its head. It appears on upon a prominent bridge, and it decapitates victims as it endlessly searches for its own head. Should someone should someone escape an encounter with the headless rider, they might find a different domain on the opposite side of the spirit's bridge. See the Dullahan in chapter five for more details on the headless rider, and we will get to the Dullahan. <laughs> we will get to the Dullahan. Um... We talked about the beast here being very, very good in this book. Uh, so we'll, we'll get to that a bit. That's really cool. I, again, I, I like that some of these are not necessarily fixed places. Um, some of them are mobile. Yeah. And then that way you don't need to start a whole new campaign or try to try to pull your players out of their current dimension and into this demiplane. You could just be like, here's a, or an area I already mapped out in my homebrew world. The writer shows up. Now that area is under the effects of the... Of, of that that dark lord and, and yeah. what did they do to it he, he literally just shows up on a bridge and takes the bridge over and now that bridge is his domain yeah oh, that's really really cool i love I'm, it I'm, I, have such, I have such strong visuals of like you know like, like you said it's a prominent bridge it's a prominent trade bridge and then like it's shrouded in mist and it's the forest is lifeless and quiet all around it and oh, i just think it's really really cool yeah um and then this one is really weird but and i absolutely love it um, it's called Skena. Um so it's it's a, and it's a theater. Ooh, I'm intrigued. Yeah, so it's dark. <sighs> it's dark lord is um Le Mont Sedium Juste. Uh, it's hallmarks are it's hallmark is it, it is a reality manipulating theater. 
Uh, Le Mans said EMG stay fancied himself a serious playwright and he achieved popular if not critical acclaim throughout Dement Liu for his works of grisly horror but he craved respectability and with his new play Apparitions Le Mans believed he would find it the night of the premiere when the audience signalled their boredom the playwright was crestfallen his supporters wanted blood so he gave them what they craved by the play's end Le Mans had joined the play and viscerally murdered every member of the cast while the crowd roared their approval as the show ended the playhouse broke from Dement Liu and Skena was formed comprising a single playhouse the domain can create any reality Le Mans desired upon its stage the dark lord's immersive performance are somewhat predictable though as they always end in slaughter that uh that's that leaves a lot of open-ended stuff for like really you can get really weird with that i mean if if you can manipulate reality and you can present any scenario to you i mean i think that could be really cool for your uh, players darkest fears I will, yeah, I was going to say, your players dark and fear, darkest fears or if your players have like somewhat troubled pasts, you know, you could drudge all that stuff up and have them relive, like you'd have all four party members reliving one party member's dark past where they killed someone and whatever else. Yeah. Um, that could be really cool. Speaking of uh, Dementlu, Dementlu? Do you have a pronounce? Um, that was one of the places I found particularly interesting in terms, that's one of the main domains of Dread. Yes. Um, Dementlu is a, it's a city um where oh uh, yes it, uh, this one yes this one's very good there is a a duchess who rules the who rules the city i'm going to bring it up here now sorry. Uh, uh, yeah. so she, she rules the city uh and everyone uh regularly she hosts these uh these parties and events and these balls and galas at her estate and everyone in the city wants to go to these things they they, they desire to go there so desperately the thing of it is uh everyone dresses quite decadently and and wears these like uh, almost like Venetian style masks, uh, and all and and they they go to these social events like it's the most important thing in the world. The entire city is, even though maybe at one point it looked fancy and decadent and stuff like that, it's like rotting and decaying. So the water is like brat like horrific and disgusting uh, inside the port. Uh, the buildings are kind of crumbling and and, and rusting and rotting. And everything, pe- the people don't realize it though. The people think they live these beautiful, wonderful, decadent lives, um, and, and where so where the social climb is all there is to worry about. But actually, they're living these quite squalid, disgusting lives, and they don't even really realize it's kind of a, a mind-altering spell that kind of uh, that kind of tricks them into believing that. And it immediately, I, I think it's really, really cool. It immediately reminded me of that game, Be Happy Few. That's exactly what I thought of as well. Or um... yeah, yeah. Like a like a it also kind of a little bit about equilibrium where like they are, they they purposely like kill their yeah. emotions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, where it's 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 like she's almost like trying to create a perfect social happy society. Oh, it's one division. But but what she? Oh my god, it's very one division. Yeah, absolutely. Um, where these people are kind of trapped in this cycle of going to these balls and these galas. Um, there's a really, it's like the opening scene of We Happy Few is something that just, it, like, I heard the game itself wasn't great yeah. in the end, but I think the concept is so interesting because the opening scene is basically there's this town. Everyone in the town regularly takes these medications, these drugs, to keep them. They're called Joy, safe. aren't they? Oh, it's called joy that's it yeah. yeah and they take joy so that they can stay happy and stay positive and everything's great uh, and you play someone whose joy wears off you didn't take your last dose or you missed a dose or something. so you start to become uh what's the word you're, you're not that's uh when you're lucid yeah um and you're aware of your surroundings and it first happens when you and some people are hitting a pinata um and trying oh, to beat yeah. it open um, and you break it open and all the candy falls all over the floor and you all start eating and as you're eating uh, you the joy wears off and you realize the, the lovely colorful room you're in is actually not that colorful and lovely and what the people are actually eating is they've beaten a rat to death and they are eating the innards of the rat but they think it's candy and I think there's something so immensely fucked up about about like altering people's perceptions yeah. and then they try to like hurt you because you're they see something wrong with you because you're not eating this dead rat, but you're the only person that's awake. And I think something like that set in this dark domain would be so... It's so twisted. I love it so much. This is one of the ones that immediately the, grasped me. And I was like, I want I want to play something of this. This is so good. The, the, the kicker in the last paragraph as well with the red death is so cool. I love it. Yeah, there's so the... Uh, lady, oh, not her name's not Lady Dementia. Her name is uh, Duchess uh, uh, Cedria de Honer. 
uh, and she's actually just a, she's a wraith. Um, there's like a plague that killed her and everyone else at this party, but then she kind of resurrected as a wraith, and now she uh, manipulates the minds of everyone in the city as if parties, these galas, are constantly going on. So she's kind of trapped in this uh, repetitive cycle of of playing the part of this duchess. Um, Wonder and there's backstory to her and stuff like that. It's it's such it's so one division. I didn't even realize it's so one division. Um, she... That'd be a really really cool one to to play through with yeah. your with your uh, party. But John, if you if you let the mask slip, you're basically you're made a poor person and you're sent down to the slums. And there's this like murderous ghost that stalks the slums called the Red Death that only targets mm-hmm. poor people. Um, uh, oh, it's, sorry, it's, it's cool as well. Yeah. Uh, the stat block. Uh, if you're a player. Uh, stop listening now. Uh, but if you're a DM and you read this, it's amazing. The stat block for uh, for uh, Lady Dun, what's it? I think it's Dunare. Dunare, yes, uh, Duchess Dunare. And um, the stat block for her you're is that she's basically You're thinking of Lady Dimitrescu, aren't you? Uh, I, every time I see De, every time I see Dimitrescu, I I think Dimit. Uh, yeah, that that thing uh, resident I, I think it's actually Dimitrescu. Dimitrescu. Aren't we all thinking about Lady Dimitrescu though, Martin? Really, when you think about it? <laughs> uh, no, I'm, f- I'm far enough along in a playthrough of that game to have seen some shit. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Same. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there's, she's basically just a wraith stat block. Um, and which, the one change that they made and I really love is she can just cast Disintegrate at will and it's an eight, <laughs> a DC 18 uh, save. Oh my there's God. literally some... There's literally some art of her at a party. Um, let me see her now. Yeah. She can cast a disintegrate spell on any creature that reveals themselves to be lying about who they are. Uh, and it's a spell save uh, DC 18. Uh, there's literally a, a picture of her gliding ghostly like down the stairs in this in this lovely red dress. And someone at the party's mask is on the floor. And she's just going like this. And they're just rotting and turning to dust. She just thanos them. Yeah, she thanos them good. I'm looking at it now. Jesus. Um, uh, her... And look, everyone else is just like, there's a guy. Watch the guy to the far left. He's just like, oh my. He's just, he's just like, oh, oh what, an, what an event. What an occasion. <laughs> there's, there's, I think it's so cool. Jesus, there's a dude behind him with a Russian pan, loving life, waiting for a man to finish he... crumbling. <laughs> You, he he I, I, he's gonna be some side character should, should I show her, should I I, I, I kind of want to show this on, on, on screen but it will mess with our with our overlay <laughs> uh yeah just just go look at the buy the book buy yeah, the book guys yeah, it's a good just, book just buy the book so you can see the the, the pan goblin <laughs> he's literally yeah I, I think he's I, I would definitely make him like a side character where he's just like May, I, like maybe because she's a wraith maybe bits of dust and skin and stuff just consistently fall off of her so he's constantly no, no, no. following her sweeping that up he's he's got a brush and pan because she's constantly disintegrating people well that too yeah <laughs> like yeah. like he's he's with her at all times and he just gets a kick out of watching people get disintegrated oh my god like he's he's a bin goblin is what he is <laughs> he's a bin goblin <laughs> Oh, that's really good. Are you really a duchess uh, if you don't have your own resident bin goblin? No, you are not. Certainly not. Oh, um, god. <coughs> that, that was one of the ones that jumped out at me as being really, really cool. Um, that was one, that's actually well, that's probably the one that grasped me the most early on. I just thought the idea of the mind manipulation and people being under this kind of uh, this trance state was really, really interesting. Hell yeah. Um, another one that has a similar kind of vibe, not the same, but a similar vibe, is uh, is the first one that shows up in the book, which is Borka. Ooh, I, I don't think and, I've read over this. So, so fill us in there. Uh, so Borka is basically it has a similar kind of like the, it's the entire realm is uh, is this corrupt uh, aristocracy um, who are like just constantly they they basically live these really rich lives inside of the cities and towns and stuff like that and the people in the countryside are starving and all this and they're they're basically stripping like the wealth and the food and everything out from the countryside into the city and they're li- leading these lavish lifestyles. But there's like, like I'll bring up the the name of the the lords. Now there's two lords to this one, and one of them is literally, uh, her name is Ivana Borizzi, uh, and she is known as uh, Ivana the Poisoner. Um, is this the perfume just... one? Yes, I believe so. Oh, that that the lore behind that is really cool. Uh, so that they, yeah, they're just kind of like it's all about these like aristocrats who are like 
living these lives and they're just kind of killing one another, they're poisoning and killing one another each other and stuff like that and, and assassinations and i thought they that's not even particularly supernatural in nature but like there's something kind of haunting about the idea of like this oppressive all powerful all all present uh, aristocracy where they're almost like i think the the horror aspect of this is like they are in human levels of like they're not able to see that the peasants are people they're not able like they would almost toy with life and murder people and stuff like that uh and yes i'm i'm aware this is real life right? <laughs> i was about to say I, I was about to say so this dark domain is capitalism <laughs> so yes exactly yeah so this dark domain is mm, most countries in the western world um but yeah i, I think it's 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 literally like what if capitalism was a horror story or well what if it was more of a horror story <laughs> that would make van richten bernie sanders <laughs> um, if I ever run anything in Barovia or anything else, Van Richten now officially sounds like Bernie Sanders. I am once again asking you for your help against Barovia. The top one percent of all vampires die when you stab with a stake. <laughs> oh the top one oh. percent of all dark domains are run by a dark lord. <laughs> Is, is is has the meme been dead for too long for me to make the thumbnail for this uh video just the, the cover of Van Richten's Guide to Raven off where where, where uh, like um where Strad is like that and then just photoshop the Bernie chair meme where he's in beside him <laughs> Bert, no not nothing Bernie Sanders ever does. Uh, I'm I am i am going to finish the sentence but I already regret it. Nothing Bernie Sanders ever does uh will die. Except you know both his presidential uh, candidacies, candidacies. Died. Was assassinated by his own party. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there's that. Hey, uh, speaking of uh, other politicians taking out politicians, back to Borka. <laughs> Le yeah, let's let, let's stick let's stick back to, fan to the fantasy realm. It's slightly less depressing. You know what? Let's get off Borka because it's a, it's a lot less fantasy than I thought it was, yeah. <laughs> and it's just depressing I, me. There's, I got. I, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna look in the other domains because there is one. I cannot, re I cannot for the life of me remember that. I nearly wrote it down. Is it... Uh, can I talk about one while we're doing that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, okay. go ahead. Um, there's one here, and I think it's really, really cool, Um, and it's called Harakir. Uh, it's like an Egyptian motif with, like, mummies Very, and yeah. tombs and all that. I think it's super, super cool. One thing that got me about this, right? So there's a, basically there's like this immortal um pharaoh, that, this undead immortal pharaoh that rules the domain. Um, and there's a lot of tombs to plunder and stuff like that. I think that could be really cool for like dungeon crawling. One thing that stuck out to me is there's basically, uh, I don't know if they have a name for it. I'll see if they have a name for it. But they basically have this, the entire uh, kingdom, the entire realm or domain has a system of interconnecting underground tombs. It's like tombs on top of tombs on top of tombs. And immediately what I thought is that's like a really interesting, unique take on a different kind of underdark like you could run a long-term under underdark i'm doing a quotation marks for those who can't see me um in this place in in the all these interconnected labyrinthine tombs um but it's, it's just a very unique spin on that and you could be you know cracking open tomb after tomb there might be some tombs that were robbed years and years ago some might be like miles underground you know again there are tombs beneath tombs beneath tombs um I just thought that was super, super interesting and a really kind of unique take on the whole idea of traveling underground for the Underdark and stuff like that, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it's just, it, it does, it very much captures the, the we've awoken, we've accidentally awoken the mummy uh, kind of thing, if I, you're interested in that. What are you... fantastic movies. Oh, dude, yeah. Well, the first two. Um, the first two, yeah. yeah. Uh, not, the, not, the Tom, not the Tom Cruise one. And not the Scorpion King. Uh, oh, God, no, no, not the Scorpion. <laughs> I, I, do you know what? <laughs> Even the second movie is a little bit eh with that, that CGI. Okay, CGI actually, of so all the time. movie is good. The CGI is terrible. Um, I think yeah. what I like, I think almost what I like the most about this book is just the, the different, like the amount of different like flavors of different cultures and just all the different yeah. backgrounds that they build into. Like you could literally take any of these dark domains, and I know like there some of them are intended to be put together or whatever, or you kind of remix them how you feel. But like you could do an entire campaign in this dark do in a dark domain, one twenty. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I mean that they. they 
they genuinely give you enough information on each one. I mean, uh, one thing actually, so the, the sections they give you on most of them, right? They'll give you the Dark Lord, what type of genre it is, uh, the hallmarks of this thing, you know? So for example, for uh, Harakir, it's Ancient Tombs, uh, Desert Perils, Lost Gods and Mummies. Very cool. Uh, they give you noteworthy features, which are just kind of like some of the headlines of the kind of stuff that goes on. They give you... Uh, uh, Arakin characters. So if you want to play a character who's actually from that realm, what kind of, what would you look like? What would you sound like? What's your kind of look on life and stuff like that? Very, very cool. They give you a full map. Uh, of that map, all the kind of named locations are then listed below and you get a paragraph on each one explaining what each of them is like and stuff like that. It's just... Oh, I don't know. There's just an absolutely insane amount of information per domain and like you said you could totally just run um you could just run an entire campaign inside of one of these very very easily and just the the amount of like story threads and plot threads that they give you just in like the the brief descriptions beforehand i thought if i found oh, they, do, they, give, they give you uh they do give you what's it uh adventures uh, adventures in harakir uh, so they'll give you a bunch of different start off ones. Even just this is a unique one for Harakir, but they do have uh, the different gods uh, of that. Uh, Anu who judges the fate of the dead, Essay who presides over the life and the living, Neb who guards the path of death, uh, Oru who orders the heavens and all beneath. Uh, very very cool. It's just like they give you such you genuinely could, uh, like you said, you could do an entire campaign quite easily on uh and on like, any one of these domains even if you don't want to use the domains necessarily like if you're not doing like if you don't want to do a straight up like horror thing you can just mm. take there's so many elements from this that you could take as like plot threads or story inspirations or like the seed of an arc um mm. i did find the one i was looking for it's actually one of the main domains and it was darkon um darkon it's a domain on the brink of destruction has no dark lord um and it's dark fantasy and disaster horror and it's all actually it's a fractured realm of magical ruins and on it's an ongoing supernatural ca catastrophe um and man like it's just it, it all just it's got such a dark souls vibe to it um yeah once the prison of lich as alien rex dark uh dark on stretched between two oceans uh, stretched between two oceans its lands filled with gothic cities and the monuments of forgotten wizard tyrants largely ignoring his role as ruler as dwelled in seclusion while manufacturing magical atrocities and manipulating prophecies to free himself from the dark powers grip he finally succeeded orchestrating a magical event that shook the entire domain the hour of ascension the dark lord vanished and darkon changed since Azalin's disappearance a strange golden star called the king's tear hangs in the heavens and each night the mists surround the domain royal with hidden activity and creep inwards these mists now known throughout the domain as the shroud erode darkon's borders those fleeing the shroud report strange shapes and figures within what happens to the lands claimed by the shroud is a mystery and none who went to return like oh there's something obviously oh, okay so this is case. actually the one of the this is one of the uh, rare ones where there is no... It's listed Dark Lord None mm. because Harkon has... Is it Harkon his name? Uh, Azalin. Uh, Azalin. Azalin Rex. Um, Azalin has departed this realm or whatever and gone away. And there's something... I don't know why. Oh, there's something very unsettling. There's a vampire about... secret police as well. Oh, that's right. Yes, there is. There's, it's uh, under, is... under known officials. The, the Karagat, the nation's secret police, is particularly active in, in Darkon's largest cities, uh, mm -hmm. Martyr Abbey and Ilaluk. Uh, they're yeah, they're basically like vampire secret police, which is just such a fucked up but cool idea. There's a, uh, but I mean, like, isn't there something very unsettling about the idea that this domain, these domains which are normally helmed by some dark lord, this one's just unhinged. This one's just uh, a ship sailing of its own accord. It's just going with the current, and, it's and there's actively, something kind of unsettling about it's, that. It's actively crumbling as well. That, that that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. It, it's like you're kind of you're, you're jumping into a world that's. You know, entropy is uh, is taking hold, and and the world is is spinning down now. You know, it's 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 kind of interesting. It's it's very it is it's it's just so so dark souls. Like you have to relink the flame to stop everything. Uh, relink in dark souls, you have to relink uh, relink the flame to restart the cycle of fire, so that the world doesn't turn to a world doesn't uh, go to an age of dark, um, and everything is crumbling, and the heroes of old have failed, and all the gods have failed, and all, this, and it's just it's very much the vibe this gives off. I'm um, like, oh god man if i had that for the for the dark souls one shot i ran you through oh so good <laughs> it would really good um there's the another map one is there beautiful as well the map is gorgeous um there's another one i have here <laughs> lake, lake placid is on this lake placid is a horror movie but a giant uh crocodile, like a crocodile isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um there's one in there called haslan uh, yes. which is 
it basically, and this this one, if you want to talk about things getting a bit too real, okay, uh, this one is basically a wizard surveillance state. <laughs> yeah, Jesus Christ, yeah. My, where where um, buildings and people and clothing and objects are are coated or painted with this eye of Haslick. Haslick is the the wizard who runs and he is the dark lord of the domain and because his eye is on everything yes, he perceives yeah. all and like everyone is either a test subject or an apprentice basically yeah and like magic has warped the the realm and its creatures as well so you have just monsters monsters going rampant and then like it describes that there's like whole there's like uh, whole sections of like towns and and landscape that are like have these scars of like magical detonations and and stuff like that that scar the landscape um a wizard surveillance state holy hell <laughs> <laughs> they do it they do it the nerds <laughs> <laughs> i'm joking uh, i joke i joke uh, and, and just uh, and the, on the trio of uh so if we're talking about uh, aristocrats that don't care about the lower class being one uh, a, a wizard surveillance state being the second, the third in the trifecta of uh, dark domains, which are just a little too real for our world. <laughs> the Black Mirror um, dark domains. Yeah, exactly. Is uh, is I think it's called uh, Recambulot, and it is a a world racked by a recurring plague. <laughs> oh yes, yes. The, oh man, I I oh god. <laughs> yeah, I see. I I for some reason I thought like um Vermintide Black Death that kind of thing. More so. Well, I mean, I mean, like it is. They do describe that like uh, swarms of rats about uh, breed and carry this. So it's very much like uh, the Black Death in in Europe and stuff like that. But um, anyone with yeah, the... big Doctor fantasies, you can get them out of the way now in D and D. Oh, they'll never get them out of the way. There's too <laughs> many plague doctors out there. Uh, yeah. They're, but yeah, that, uh, that would that would be the place to do it, I suppose. They're uh, what would you call them? Uh... They they're a plague, is what they are. <laughs> Yes, Connor. Yes. Uh, okay. Should shall we have a chat about some of the fun beasties that came along with this book? Uh, do you know what? Let's do it. Let's do it because oh, okay. I I I love me some beasties. Should we just touch on some of our favorites and kind of go into them in, in more detail? Yeah. Do you want to just start off with the one we're both thinking about? Yeah. Yeah. I do. Hang on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's, I'm gonna bring it up here. We both we we know what we want to talk about here. Oh, and it's the Dullahan. It's the Dullahan. Dullahan? Dullahan? Uh, uh, there's no father over the U, so Dullahan, I think. Dullahan. Yeah. Uh, so, obvious reason why I bought like this. Powerful as hell. Oh, Second reason, dude. it's it's an, it's an Irish it's an Irish folk legend, I believe originally isn't that right? Uh, it is, yeah. It's it's it. A uh, Dullahan is a uh, is like it's an e- I think it's an e- it's an evil fairy that um in this it's depicted as riding like a flaming horse, headless warrior who carries like a battle axe. Um, in Irish mythology. Uh, they carried a, a, a whip made from the spine of a human being, and uh, they carried. Oh, do you know what? And they carried their severed head in their other hand by the hair. Do you know what? If you look, I, I think I want to say it's Creature Codex, but I could be wrong. If you look in Creature Codex, there's a stat block for that, and in that he does have the the spine whip yeah. and the head, I believe. Um, he, this I, one is particularly yeah. cool. It's 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 very powerful, yeah. uh, and it's it's a challenge rating ten, which is absolute bull because this I, is so much stronger than I, a challenge rating ten. I I would put this against like so do it in, in terms of how the book is. Or supposedly a challenge rating ten creature would be a fair or, or a fair challenge for four level ten characters. I would yeah. never put this against four level ten characters because it will kill them all. <laughs> so. Uh, a couple of things that stand out, right? It's got it's got a fair amount of health, not a ton. Decent armor, sixteen. Um, average speed, thirty. It's got true sight, which is just just the first thing. It's one hundred twenty feet, despite having no head. It has true sight. Yeah. Um. So no, uh, no invisibility, no illusions, no none self. of that. It's gonna see him. Yeah. Uh. Then it's got uh, I think where it can summon these things called death's heads. Yeah. Uh, cool thing about them is that uh, if you look at the stat block for them, they can appear as just regular like people's heads, uh, but they also have a thing where you can summon them in two other ways. One of which is uh, they are the heads of Medusas and can potentially turn Ooh. you to stone, and the other way is that they are the heads of Nothics and can I believe they can uh, find in the same way Nothics can they can like find out information about you by looking at you or by biting you potentially. Um, but there's just these flying heads that come down and they bite you, uh, and it can summon it can summon these. Uh, what's it? Uh, if it, it's okay, yeah. So 
this kind of pairs up with another thing which I've only seen on the on the stat block for this, which is something called Mythic Actions. These are yes. this uh, this is premiering here in this. No, book, uh, they're in Theros. Are they in Theros as well? Yeah. Oh, they are. You're right. You're right. So, well, this this is I I I haven't read Theros too too closely. Uh, that's yeah. very much your more your uh, speed than mine. Yeah, I think. They have like the <laughs> Mythic Hydra and the Mythic Giants and the Mythic yeah, um, yeah. Cerberuses as well. Cerberi, Cerberi, maybe. Uh, Cerberi, yeah. I guess. Yeah. But oh my god, like headless summoning, like the first line, like I literally, I read the first line, then I read it again, then I read it a third time, and went, "What the fuck?" <laughs> yeah. So if if the if the Dullahan is reduced to zero hit points, it doesn't die or fall unconscious. Instead, it regains ninety seven hit points, which is about like sixty <laughs> percent of its hit points. <laughs> like it, it's a, that's it. If the Dula, if the Dullahan loses all its hit points, it instead gets more hit points. <laughs> Because why not? Um, well done, you like, killed this creature. You've now healed ninety-seven hit points. <laughs> this is like this is like the um, the uh, pinnacle of this. This isn't even my final form. Oh Christ! Uh, because what happens after it regains those? In addition, it summons three death heads, one of each type, so one human, one Medusa, one Nothic, um, in unoccupied spaces next to it. The death heads are under the Dullahan's control and act immediately after its turn in the initiative order. Uh, additionally, the Dullahan can now use its mythic actions, which were locked up until now. Uh, awarding... <laughs> oh, sorry, that's just an XP, XP thing after that. So its mythic actions are, like, one of them is that it, the Dullahan makes a battle axe attack, and then one death head of the Dullahan can see within 30 feet can use its reaction to make a melee attack. So it's 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 using these to basically make additional attacks on a turn using its, its companions. And then Headless Whale, an Echo Shriek... It, uh, this this line, the, an echoing shriek issues from the Dullahan's headless stump. <laughs> each each creature of the Dullahan's choice within ten feet must make a, a DC fifteen Wisdom saving throw. Each creature takes three D ten uh, psychic damage on a failed save and half as much on a success. And if one or more creatures fail the saving throw, the Dullahan gains temporary hit points. I love that. Yeah, it feeds on your fear. Um. And so you will be afraid. Different. You will be very, very afraid. <laughs> and uh, like, he gets not... to do that. That's after you've burned all your big spells to take it out the first time as well. Yeah, yeah. And it has it has legendary resistances, same as normal. Uh, so that's after you've after you've already killed this thing. It gets back up and then it does this, <laughs> uh, which is just insane. Uh, well, actually, these are, and these are these are only additional things because it gets two attacks with its axe. Yep. Right. And it's a hell yeah. of an axe. <laughs> It's 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 a D eight slashing normal, and then uh and then it does two D ten necrotic damage, right? So that's that's hefty for any level. Uh, if the if it scores a critical hit against the creature, the target must succeed on a DC fifteen saving throw, or the duel hand cuts the the target's head off, just vorpal sword style. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, the target dies if it can't survive without a head. Which is most most player characters, uh, a creature doesn't uh, a creature doesn't have a head, or has legendary actions. Instead, takes uh, sixty eight slashing damage. That's that's on par with like the open palm bunks thing, where like either you die or you take an absolute <laughs> butt ton of ne of necrotic damage. Yeah. Either way, it's bad. Like, uh, uh, oh. and then also, I, also the fiery skull. So it has a range attack of a fiery skull. It's two D ten plus three fire. That's fair enough. It's got a range of one hundred and twenty <laughs> feet. I'm just picturing him hawking fiery skulls one hundred and twenty feet. I didn't realize he was the headless horseman and Shang Tsung. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> just whipping. Oh, I'm, I'm just picturing him on horseback chasing you down, whipping flaming skulls at you. It's okay, guys. Uh, We're gotten away. We're too far away. And then it's the person talking's head is replaced with just a chattering, burning skull. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was something else here on this on, on him as well. Uh, the leg legendary actions. Uh, the do yeah. So his he hits his normal attack. He can use his frightful presence, um, and then uh, the Dullahan moves up to its speed without provoking opportunity attacks and makes one battle axe attack with advantage. Keeping in mind, if it gets a crit, you potentially lose your head and your character. Done. Gone. Uh, if the attack hits but is not a critical, the attack still deals. <laughs> An extra 68 necrotic damage. And that's a legendary action. It gets how many? It gets three legendary actions. It costs all three to do that. Yeah. Uh, so no more legendary actions that round. But still, that's like... that Again, right, you have a 10% chance instead of a 5% chance. 
okay, not counting the fact that they have to succeed a, a, a con saving throw as well. But it's, it's a DC a, fifteen though. That's how, that's high enough. That's high, yeah, that's decent. Like, um, so you're talking about a, a DC fifteen. If that was DC twelve, I still wouldn't be comfortable. <laughs> like, if I was a character <laughs> making that save, it'd be DC twelve can save, and I have a plus four to my can. I'd be like, oh shit. <laughs> I would say, I would say on average. The characters that we've had in game probably have a plus two yeah. to their con on average. Yeah. Pair that up, and and then I suppose what most, not all classes. A lot of casters get it. Not all other classes get like what the fighters get a uh, strength and dex profi- uh, saving throw proficiencies, don't they? Yeah. And then I think barbs get con. Yeah, barbs get con and strength. Um, con and strength, fighter, yeah. fighters get strength and dex. Um, rogues get like intelligence and deck so they wouldn't have a proficiency bonus on that sorcerers get a boost to con don't they which do sorcerers oh yeah I think I think sorcerers I think sorcerers and wizards because they have to concentrate on spells they both get saving throws on spell proficiencies yeah Um, warlock is wisdom and charisma but yeah let me like you're going like okay again it's once a round yeah but I, it's it's just that like again, it's very like the open palm monk where like even the failed state, either you get you just die from losing your head because you have a ten percent chance of getting your head lopped off instead of a five percent chance now, assuming you don't fa- uh, succeed the save. <laughs> and even if you succeed and you're like, oh, nineteen, and the DM's like, you succeed, you only take sixty-eight necrotic damage. Ah. Uh, that's just absolutely insane. Oh, also, it's resistant to cold, lightning, and poison, isn't it? and is immune to charm, fear, and poison. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just... Uh, it's insane. It's, a, it's, a, it's, an ins- it's probably one of the better monster stat blocks I've seen in ages. Only for the... like. Because here's the thing, right? Um, it's, it's hard enough, particularly when players know what the monster is, it's kind of hard enough to make players fearful of, of most monsters in D&D. Uh, again, particularly you you play on my game, Martin. So when I'm putting you up against a monster, there's some monsters like I put you up against, up against a beholder not long ago. I think that was a pretty yeah, you know, beholder being such an iconic monster. I think you guys are like, oh no, beholders was, are no that, joke. That was a brown trousers moment, right, Jay? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, but I think like, I think one the fact that this has a fairly atypical rules associated with it, the fact that it gets it can potentially lop your head off is a rule that. And, but, not like, a lot of things but like, that's not just a monster either. That's a fucking domain. Like, that can just show up while you're in fucking Barovia. That's, oh. Yeah. <laughs> like, and like, you're a bunch of level oh. fives in Barovia. You're you you run out of a haunted house into a field to try and get away. You hear the, the like the neigh of a horse nearby, and this thing comes down the road after you. I would, if I was running Curse of Strahd, I'd absolutely put this in. I would, I would, I would put this in, and I would, I would, I would make it a recurring. It's just a horseman who never stops riding. He's just constantly roaming the countryside of Barovia, and then occasionally you may come across him. I'd, I'd like yeah. roll random encounters, and you might come across him. <laughs> Dude, like I'm, I'm not joking. Like anything below level ten that just comes across this, like. The only thing I could think of doing to this. Ah, thing... relax, Martin. It's nothing to lose your head over. For people who are only listening, you're missing the absolute daggers that I'm staring at my co-host right now. I can feel them. That's some sneak attack daggers right there, Martin. I can feel it. I, ho- I hope you take psychic damage from this because I took psychic <laughs> damage from that joke. Uh, yeah, just you could do such a really fun, like short, like sleepy hollow campaign with this. Yeah. Yeah, and just, that, that that'd be a that like. Do you know what's kind of cool about this is that I I feel like D and D early early game D and D has a very. We're in a town slash village. There's a monster harassing the town thing, but I feel like late game D and D that kind of loses its. It kind of loses the it's uh it's hard to make that in late game D and D. I feel like uh at a certain point when you start getting because okay you could be like here's a village, small village farmers and the like, they can't protect themselves, so the adventurers are going to do it for them. When it's a small game and, and it's like, oh, there's some goblins in the woods, that's like, okay, that's clearly too much for farmers, but manageable for, for uh, the players. When, when you scale that up with higher levels, it doesn't make sense how a, like you could say, all right, the, these 10th to 15th level players are in a small village, but now there's something that's adequately scaled to their level uh yeah would, would like like this this would be perfect for that 
this 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 I think is like the perfect if you want to in mid to late game if you want to get back down to the gra like grassroots kind of uh, there's a monster harassing a town one monster and we got to sort it out. I think this would be a very, very cool monster to go up against. Uh, the, art, the art actually here is beautiful, but the art has him riding a nightmare. Yeah. I'd absolutely have him riding a nightmare. He'd be riding a nightmare all fucking day long. Where does it say it has to be a horse? Have him ride a purple worm. You said that in chat <laughs> earlier, and I was like, hmm, interesting. <laughs> yeah. But like, actually, do oh, it like the go. nightmare. Do it like the nightmare, though, that it's like flaming skeletal purple worm. I, I like, Yeah, I was going to say, do, do that. But I, what I was going to say is, Reflavor the Dullahan so it's not like a human man on a horse on the surface. Make it a, a, a long dead drow in the underdark who rides a purple worm and shows up occasionally. <laughs> I thought you were going to go down the drider route when you started to say, when you started saying a long dead drow, where it's like it's a long dead creature that's a, that's fused to this purple worm. Uh, or oh, potentially. Uh, I I was more so going like just reflavoring it for different environments. Yeah. So that, like, if you're in the Underdark, you're like, well, we're not going to run into a, a horseman down here. No, you won't, but you'll run into a purple wormman. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dear, just... a, a wall explodes next to you and a worm comes out and everyone's like, oh, no, a purple worm. And then, like, not just a purple worm, look on top of him. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and then there's, there's the Dullah head. Dude, it's just, like, they're, yeah, like, I really want, like, ooh, I don't want to say, I, like, I want to throw these at a party for Halloween. One of these at a party for Halloween or something, you know, just like completely unconnected mm. to the story, just like interrupt like regular traveling with this. Yeah, uh, we we should we should move on. I, we're 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 oohing and on over this guy just a little bit too much, and he is phenomenal. Dude. But uh, but yeah, I think uh, there's another one here just a little bit up from that. Uh, one I really liked, particularly because I have some undead stuff going at the moment. Is uh is the Carrion Stalker. Ooh, um, yes, yes, yes. Which yes. is it's it's a, like a little bug thing, and they it, feast inside of dead bodies. What I think is really cool about them is they pair super well with zombies and other undead because they will live inside the rotting flesh of undead, and then when they get close to living creatures, they'll try to jump out at you and pierce your flesh and 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 lay their larva inside of you. Uh, and I think that pairs super well. It's very I, I unsettling. Hate, I hate that. I hate that so much. <laughs> yeah, it's very unsettling. Um, but I, I do think it's super, super cool. Um, also, the art sounds really cool as well. They look like little uh, weird tentatively crab thingies. They remind me of like, um, not Ammonite, uh, Kabuto from Pokemon. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's something else as well. We can't uh, it, it sort of reminds me, it's similar art style to the Darren Shan Demon Atta books as well. One of the demons and that looked quite like that. Uh oh oh wait i need to find something here okay there's a there's a monster here but it's created by a different monster somewhere else in the book it's is it, i think it's in the uh the a k to z one i think um is it is the, it's the one where the, the art is a is it is a chair mm, no no oh no although <laughs> i'm looking at is that is that the swarm of maggots yeah it is yeah yeah the, that's unsettling as all else. i have you ever like you ever see maggots in real life? Yeah, I get a primal reaction to that. I I'm not like afraid of a I, I'm not afraid of a single maggot. You can put a maggot in my hand and it will wriggle and all that, and I'd be fine. The sight of multiple maggots wriggling and writhing with each other just sets off something in my brain. Something you, primal uh, that I can't help. How do you do? You, are you how are you with like pumice stones and like pomegranates? Oh, it's in like the the, the is it tripper? Uh, no. trip porophobia. I, I think trip tri tripophobia. I, I, sorry, it is tripophobia. Tri yeah, with all the little holes and stuff in it. I'm fine with that kind of stuff. Uh, we actually we have a stone in our front garden. A rock is part of the rockery on the on the right hand side of our garden when you come in, and it is full of those holes. <laughs> and Tara is like Tara takes a wide berth around it. She does not like it, uh, but it's just a rock with holes in it. So I'm fine with that. But there's something about the wriggling of maggots or in worms or something like that just like just where as a species we're, we're like hard coded to associate those with like like unclean rotting things yeah. and as a species like we're like hard coded to avoid that stuff 
Um, so yeah, it's natural for you to feel like that. And that's all things you can play on really hardcore if you're running one of these domains. Just uh, like uh, maybe like just check with players first. Definitely do like a session zero with safety tools to be like, are there ad- are there any fears that anyone has that they would not like me to go into? Because <laughs> I I I break that I, well I don't break that rule, but I, I it's a fear of yours I constantly play on. <laughs> it's because it's, is... it's because it's not a super bad one. I just am very uncomfortable around snakes. You don't like snakes, and no. I. <laughs> No, I don't. I've, I've run so many snake-related arcs in our D&D games because I know it bugs you. <laughs> you I, I know it. <coughs> but like, here, do you want to get back at me? Make some sort of maggot demon-related arc and I will I will curl up into a little ball of, of uncomfortableness. And I'm I, okay with it. I, I got I'm okay. You, I, I got you with something recently in a one-shot. I ran a game and you were part of it and it made you like deeply uncomfortable. And I was like, this is revenge for the snake. I think it was a spider thing, maybe. I'm I I I'm, I'm I I go back and forth on spiders. Um, I think on that day you were fourth. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, where is it? I can, there's something in. Okay, so the one I was talking about just just to kill the uh, the. Uh, whatever uh, is is the boneless. Oh yeah, it's made by um, it's made by like the steerage uh, Sturgoy. The Sturgoy makes the boneless. Is this? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, because they they are, okay. So that's like a a vampire sturge. It's it's like it's like a super buffed out, roided out sturge. Yeah, they yeah, were they were like, they were sturges that were experimented on by wizards with transmutation spells. Yes, and they have the whole thing where they can like summon sturges loads. I think it could make for a really cool low level boss encounter. It's only like challenge rating four, so that could be really cool. Yeah. Um, it's it them that makes them yeah they they like they have a whole thing where like, oh that's it that's it so instead of just being blood suckers they literally suck like blood and bone marrow and all this other stuff and the husk that they leave behind the boneless husk like which is basically a bag of meat <laughs> there's a stat block for it and it's called the boneless and yeah. i absolutely it's gross as hell but i love it so much it's so yeah. if you like your body horror this is it for for reference, it's a bag of ham with a face, basically. <laughs> it's a plastic bag filled with filled with raw meat, with a face. Uh, yeah, with a face. It's a spar. It's a spar shopping bag. Oh god. <laughs> that was that was on, and I was like, "That's really good art." I don't want to look at it again, though. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Oh god. Can, uh, I would that, have. That's I would have, thing. I think it's actually great. I would have one of those bonus things like drop out of the ceiling and land on top of a player. Oh, I, I can feel it. I can feel it. Oh, just say like, the thing is, it's undead, so it would be cold. It'd be a cold. Like, have you ever bought a? Um, It'd be like the like worst chicken version chicken possible of Nickelodeon Gunge. Have you ever bought chicken fillets in the butchers <laughs> and they just put them in a plastic bag? I I, I noticed they bought I bought chicken for my dinner just a while ago. Uh, you put all the chicken fillets in a plastic bag, but and you hold it and it's not wet because it's the outside of the bag is dry. But you can feel the cold squishy. That would be what it would feel like all over your shoulders. <laughs> yeah, it'd be like having oh god, it'd be like having a big thing of cold hair gel dropped on you. <laughs> Oh god! Oh, it's so awful. It's so, do you know what? Cold hair gel I can get over, but like this, no, like if I knew what but it it's was, it's meat. <laughs> like if you're like getting a wet towel, like a cold wet towel thrown over your shoulders, uh. completely unexpectedly. Um, let's, we'll wrap up now in a second. And but, the towel uh, is made of skin. And the towel is made of skin. <laughs> um, they have vampiric mind flares. Which oh, I dude, was absolutely dope. Because because mind flares is worth. Ba- I love. Um, have you looked into where they've come from? Where they come from? Uh, I was so, reading it before. I must forget what it was. There's it's a there's a domain called Blue, oh uh, Blutspur. Blutspur, yeah. Um, and the vampiric mind flayers are came about as a result of there is an elder brain an elder brain in Blutspur that was kicked out of its colony in exile because it basically got it, it got like a, it's an immortal but it got a disease that is killing it so it was it was looked as an aberration amongst aberrations basically and was kicked out. Yes, yeah. And when that happened, it was basically taken in by the domain rulers of Blutspur, was it? Uh, it's Blutspur. Blutspur, thank you. Of uh, Blutspur. And uh, they just put it there, and because it's it's di- like it is slowly, slowly dying, but because it is so old and so long-lived, that like it won't die for millennia yet, but because for an eternal creature, that's still way too close. So it's, yeah. it, it's going like further and having all of these like really like messed up deprived plans to try and keep it going on its own and one of those was vampiric mind flares 
is there something about them where like uh, I, I'm I'm kind of I'm skimming it here. Is oh, sorry, there anything about the, where like the, so the, the the domain the Dark Lord of the domain is called the God Brain, and that's what that Elder Brain is. Yes, and there's a thing here where like it basically sends out these these vampiric mind flares with this specific intent that they will feed to capacity, almost like a bee going out and gathering nectar. And when they come back, then uh, after doing so, they are uh, they return to the Elder Brain of Blitzfur, which liquefies them in a pool and releases their stolen essence amid the hormone brine. This grotesque bomb stalls the Elder Brain's degeneration, but is far from a cure. That's kind of a... Uh, so that they're stealing thoughts and like maybe like cerebral fluid and stuff like that, and then they're just dissolving in the pool, and then the brain gets maybe another day from each one or something like that you know yeah it's 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 messed up but I, yeah it's 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 like if you're into your like lovecraftian horror and your like body and your like sci-fi body horror yeah blue sperm might be somewhere you might want to check out because you can't actually go there it's you're like haunted by memories of of there because it's like inhospitable to like you couldn't like life couldn't possibly exist on there other than the elder brain basically yeah, yeah, I think they exist. Even even that that the the elder brain and all the mind flayer servants exist underground in that yes. realm because even the surface is too inhospitable for them. Yeah, um, yeah, there is uh, there is some utterly horrific and amazing stuff in this. The star spawn stuff. There's some more fiends. Uh, honestly, I think um, I have not. I, I genuinely have not seen a a, a monster uh, beast Jerry this good since Morden Kynans. Ooh, okay. Just last one. There's a stat block for Nosferatu. Yes, I love the Nosferatu. Uh, which is, they're basically just rabid vampires. So whereas normal vampires are kind of a bit charming and they'll lure their prey in, these guys are just filthy animals who need a fucking fix. They're, they're junkies, but they're basically blood junkies. Yeah, and they can, they have a, they have a blood puke attack. <laughs> A blood yeah, uh, a blood discord recharge in the five or six. This the Nosferatu vomits blood in a fifteen foot cone. Each creature in that area must make a DC sixteen con save. On a fail save, the creature takes eighteen or forty eight necrotic damage, and it can't regain hit points for a minute. I'm always saying more things need to vomit in D and D, but like it can't regain hit points for a minute. That's a whole fight. Yeah, <laughs> that's actually that's funny. Not, not so much funny as, as concerning. Um, that's a whole fight where you potentially get downed and people people can technically stabilize you. Actually, yeah, that's okay. I was I was just thinking no one could heal you no. to get you back from your death saving throws. You, You'd have to just go through them, but people could stabilize you without regaining any hit points. Yes, sorry, you could be stabilized yeah. at zero, but you're effectively out of the game then. And like as well Still, as that, yeah. like its bite is nasty. Like, it does damage. It does, like, an extra 2d6 necrotic damage. is a d8 piercing plus um, strength and 2d6 necrotic. Um, oh, it sorry. reduces I, your hit point maximum. Yeah, but as well, though, if um, if you're missing any of your hit points, it's 2d10 instead of 2d6 necrotic. Um, yeah. And, yeah, it's the hit point maximum is reduced by an amount equal to the necrotic damage taken. So your hit point max is reduced by 2d6. Then you, it hits you again. Now it's getting reduced by 2d10 every time. Yeah. And oh man, if a target dies, it, sorry, the target dies of a hit point maximum is reduced to zero. A humanoid slain in this way and then buried in the ground rises as a Nosferatu after one d ten days. Yeah, I I do, yeah, I, I I always like when monsters include that thing where like, oh, not only will you die, you may come back as one of these things, which is kind of horrifying in and of itself. Yeah, I do like um, that they have um sunlight hypersensitivity. They take twenty radiant damage when they start their turn in sunlight. But they, they also have... regenerate though when they're not in sunlight as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And they have spider uh, climb. And they have spider climb. Uh, but Martin. Yes, Connor. That's all the time we have for today. Ooh, it's been a spooky good time. I, I said at the start of this thing, I think if we had three episodes, we couldn't possibly cover what is in this book. It is so thick and so dense. Yeah. Um, but it's all, it's all absolute gold. The classes, the domains, the monsters everything it's it's all so bloody brilliant um this is it's if if ever if if anyone out there is like humming and hawing about what D books they buy if you're at all interested in horror or even if you're not and like if you're the person collecting the D books i think this is a must buy this um i'd say this is probably up there top three D D source books for me and like yeah i have a natural bias towards horror anyway but like like just in terms of the content you get the amount of content you get you like the only thing literally the only thing i don't you, you don't get in this i don't believe there's a magic item section that's actually the one thing you don't get you get subclasses you get 
uh, lineages. Uh, you no get... feats either. Uh, no feats. No feats. But you get backgrounds, you get domains, you get or monsters. Spells. You get some additional rules for like stress and fear and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, like, you, you get an ad, you do. You get, like, this book is so. Yeah. It, you, you get an insane amount of material for for this book. I'm excited to see. I, I, on the one hand, I'm like, this is really, really great. On the other hand, part of me is concerned that this means we won't get another thick, thick book for a while from Wizards. Ooh, um, I, I don't know, because aren't there two more books coming out this year? There are, but I'm I like I and like one of pers them is, personally a, I wasn't. There's a dragons book and a fae book coming. I don't see either of them being small. First, like for example, like they had. Okay, we're we're going over time, but um, like honestly, I I wasn't super sold on Candlekeep Mysteries. I thought it was only okay. Um, not a lot of crunch, which is a phrase you now know. Um, not a lot of crunch in Candlekeep Mysteries. Uh, this makes up for it massively. This is more my speed of book, where you give me a lot of lore and stuff but also you give me a bit of crunch as well um i'm yeah, like i don't know i'm just hoping that we get more I, I like when books are this consistent to have this much variety i don't need to have a, a book with i don't know six subclasses or feats or spells or anything like that, uh or or you know a ton of monsters but when the content they do give you is really really solid yeah like yeah like don't like i hate when i when i feel like a book is part, partly filler that bugs me this is not filler this is gold from cover to cover um, in, in, and... a, in the words of the wise sages some 41 all, fi all killer no filler <laughs> and on that note <laughs> indeed <laughs> we've gone in too deep now I'm sorry stop it <laughs> uh, okay 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 <laughs> sorry, I, I, I'd be I'd be better off on my own doing this podcast hell is on no <laughs> uh, uh, sorry I'm still waiting oh <laughs> uh, am, I, am I am I doing am I outroing us? Uh, no, I that 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 I'm still so. Uh, it was a pun. It was another song. <laughs> oh no, I know it was. So was mine. Better <laughs> off on my own. Okay, fair enough. Fair Especially enough. That's not the title of the song. That's the chorus line. But it doesn't matter. Anyway, yeah. do the outro. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, thank you guys very much for watching and hanging out while we uh, have a have a chat about some of our favorite things in Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft. Connor, where can people find you on the internet? People can find me on the internet at zero point Connor on Twitter. That's Z E R O P O I N T C O N O R one N. Very important. We did it. And we did it. Did it? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, absolute nerds, what was it? <laughs> and also every Friday at six PM Irish time here on the Mike Flares podcast on both YouTube and Spotify. Yes, looking like the massive nerd that we are. Um, you can find me on the internet mostly here on the Mike Flares podcast. Same time, same place as your good friend Connor there. Um, you can also find me on Twitter at so sorry it's over, which is in the right hand corner there. And you can find me on the Mike Flares Twitter account as well as Connor, which is in the bottom right hand corner. Um, right there, you can find that with our Spotify and YouTube links as well. Um, so that would uh, that's pretty much it for today. I believe so it'd be a, a goodbye for me. Goodbye and uh, goodbye. And, a goodbye and it's Connor. a goodbye for me. Sorry, I kind of cut over you there. And it's a goodbye for me. <laughs> Bye. And yeah, let's hope uh, we have a have a hope you all have a spooky good time with the new Van Van Richten's book, and that you'll join us here next time. I see. For... I see what you did there, man. I see what you did there. Mm, tap tempo, clever. Uh, and that you'll join us this time next week uh, for a new episode of the Mike Flares podcast. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>